Welcome to a brand new edition of Problematic Women. I'm Virginia Allen, and hosting with me today is Lauren Evans. Welcome, Lauren. So excited to be with you, Virginia. Also today, we have Rachel Del Judas, the Daily Signal's congressional reporter. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Lauren. Up on today's Problematic Women, UK parents are suing for wrongful birth after their child was born with Down syndrome. Victoria's Secret hires their first plus-size and transgender models. We discuss the Netflix series, Unbelievable. And, as always, we'll be crowning our Problematic Women of the Week. Each week on Problematic Women, we sort through the news to find stories that are of particular interest to conservative-leaning or problematic women, those whose views and opinions are often excluded by those on the so-called feminist left. If you are a problematic woman or just someone who supports strong, independent women, please consider supporting us and leaving a review or a rating on iTunes and encouraging others to subscribe. It really does make a huge difference. Our first story today takes us across the pond to the UK, where a mother filed a lawsuit against the Royal Berkshire Hospital for the wrongful birth of her son, Alexander. Alexander was born with Down syndrome. The mother, Edita Mordell, asked the hospital for a Down syndrome test early on in the pregnancy. However, when the doctor offered her the test later, she declined it. But Miss Mordell claims that she thought that the screening had been done. She said that if Down syndrome was confirmed on her screening, she would have aborted the baby. The judge hearing the case believed that since English is Miss Mordell's second language, she had misunderstood the technician's question about whether she wanted the screening or not. Miss Mordell won the case, and her lawyers claim that she should receive 200,000 pounds, or about 252,000 U.S. dollars, of damages paid out. In adding to the ruling, the judge said that his ruling did not suggest, quote, that the birth of a child with Down syndrome must be seen as unwelcome. But it, meaning the test, should be offered to all expecting mothers, the premise being that many would wish to exercise their right to proceed to medical termination in the event of a diagnosis. The mother of the child said, I would not have wanted a disabled child, and I would not have wanted my child to suffer the way that disabled people do. CBS News reports that 67% of babies diagnosed with Down syndrome in America are aborted. That number is 90% in the UK and 100% in Iceland. So Lauren and Rachel, this story really does mirror many of the instances of babies with Down syndrome who are being aborted around the world. And last year, people with Down syndrome became the first people to ask to be put on the international endangered species list. This was a topic that we covered right here on Problematic Women. Do you think that the result of a screening should ever affect the decision of a mother to abort or not? I mean, are there situations where maybe this is justified? I mean, just personally speaking, because I believe that all life should be valued. I mean, I don't think this should enter into the discussion because we're honestly looking at this. Where do we draw the line? I mean, do we draw it at the severity of the baby and how much they're going to be disabled, what the doctors think. And in many cases, and I've had friends personally in my life where their mom was told, hey, your kid is going to you know, struggle all their life with Down syndrome, and then they ended up not having any problems at all. So where do we draw the line? And I think maybe there should be a discussion about these mothers and their children and asking them while well, you have an opportunity to offer your child up for adoption if you feel like you can't take on this responsibility with a child who's going to need a lot more medical attention that you might be able to provide. But to just automatically say that these children should be basically aborted because of their medical state. I think that's a very, very dangerous, slippery slope. And as you just said, Virginia, 100% of those with Down syndrome babies in Iceland that test positive for this are aborted. So they're being wiped out from this world. And it's very sad to see. So I would be very hesitant to have that enter into the discussion. Rachel, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We can't be judging people based on what their life could be. And 100% of these kids are aborted in Iceland and Four out of five moms get the test. That means 80% of mothers get the test, and if it's test positive, then these kids are aborted. I don't know how you justify that. People with Down syndrome live full lives. They are happy. They they bring families joy, and they add to our society. And just to say, hey, oh, my kid's going to have a disability. Life could be hard for them. I don't want to give them a life. No, life's going to be hard for you for a little while, but that's what being a parent is, and that's what 
being a society is, is caring for one another, even those who are different and those who have more difficult needs. Yeah, I found it really interesting that the mother said that she would have aborted the child because she didn't want her child to, quote, suffer the way that disabled people suffer. And I was like, that <laughs> actually doesn't make any sense because all of us in life face suffering. There are going to be challenges. And people with Down syndrome have challenges that are, are very unique and specific to them, but they're challenges the same as we all face in life. Parents face challenges in raising any child, whether or not they have Down syndrome. Right. And I think, too, here when I was reading what this mother said, I think it points to an aspect of society today and countries around the world where people are saying that as a person, I have the right to put basically a value on human suffering and what I feel like I can take and what I can't take. And who are we to judge? I mean, this is not a call that we can make as humans. And for me to say, oh, I don't think my child can suffer through this, we're basically saying, I know what my child would want. And as someone who is not in their body making their decisions, I'm thinking I'm making a decision for them that they would want to make, but we don't know that. And I think to put a value or basically saying this person can suffer this much or this person can or cannot, that's not ours to make. And we're seeing this more and more. I mean, I think when abortion was legalized in 1973, that was part of a value judgment that was made of, you know, some women cannot afford to have a child or shouldn't have to have a child because they've been raped. And while, yes, our heart goes out to these people, and I think women should be held up by prayer and by people in their community and by their own families, to put a value judgment on that is so wrong. And it's basically telling the other person, especially a woman's child, hey, this kid isn't worth it. And that's that's so wrong. Yeah. And replace Down syndrome with like ADHD or anxiety. True. Those are things that people are going to struggle with their whole life. But we never say, oh, we don't even want you to try. No, like these are people that we need to be lifting up. And Rachel, I think, saying that we need to lift these women up in prayer and lift them up in our, our financial support and doing something that's so true. I thought about the people in my own life who have Down syndrome, and I really thought it would be appropriate to play a clip of a young man named Frank Stevens. Stevens has Down syndrome, and he testified before Congress earlier this year to argue for life on behalf of others with Down syndrome. Take a listen. Whatever you learn today, please remember this. I am a man with Down syndrome, and my life is worth living. I have, I have lectured at universities, acted in, in an award-winning film and an Emmy-winning TV show, and spoken to thousands of young people about the value of inclusion in making America great. Frank Stevens is just such an awesome example of someone who has Down syndrome, but is living a full and beautiful life, a life that truly does have value. I thought it was interesting that he was talking about the value of inclusion. And we know in American society today, apparently we're all about inclusion, you know, people's sexual identity, including them, where people come from relationally or, you know, in different parts of the world, including people of different races, religions, all of those things. But yet when it comes to something like Down syndrome, which is a physical handicap that these people cannot control, all of a sudden we're saying, hey, we don't value to be included. And he hit the nail on the head where, yeah, we should value inclusion, especially when it comes to a physical ailment that we can't control. And this isn't something just happening in Europe. I think when it comes to abortion, we hear these stories come out of the UK all the time. But as Virginia mentioned at the top of the show, 67% of children diagnosed with Down syndrome in the United States is aborted. That's two out of three. That's a huge number. And a problematic woman, we really encourage you to take the time to be proud of who you are as a problematic woman and discuss these issues with your friends. And I think this is one of those major issues you should be discussing when time is right and it comes up, two out of three children diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. I'll say it one more time. Two out of three children diagnosed with Down syndrome are aborted. These are people with dignity who deserve to live. And we can't be looking down, like Rachel just said, because they have a physical or mental handicap. If anything, God made these people more special and that we should embrace them even fuller. So that's my little tangent for the day. Yeah. No, Lauren, that's great. You preach. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, we are going to switch gears to another topic, talking about inclusion in a slightly different sense. 
Victoria's Secret, (laughs) their newest campaign by Pink called Love Yourself has been making headlines for a couple of reasons. They are featuring their first plus size model in the campaign, but they have received quite a bit of backlash for this. Many on Twitter have complained that they are too late to the game on this one, and others complain that the model, Allie Tate Cutler, is only a size 14, which is the first size to be considered a plus size. One tweet read, PSA, a size 14 is barely a plus size woman. This is doing the bare minimum. Others complained that Cutler has posted fat shaming posts on social media in the past. Most pointed to a tweet in which Cutler essentially said that most fat people eat meat and eating meat is of great harm to the environment. She describes herself as a feminist and environmentalist and has said, quote, being obese is simply bad for the environment. So, (laughs) Lauren and Rachel, do you think that Victoria's Secret is doing more damage to themselves by hiring a plus size model in 2019 instead of, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, especially one who has posted some things on social media that could be seen as offensive to other plus size women? I mean, I think you have a point here, Virginia. For years and years, people who were plus size, I mean, I'm just going to, you know, disclose something here. I don't shop at Victoria's Secret. I don't like what they have to offer. I mean, this is a personal judgment call that I've made, but I don't like how they exploit women, their models and everything. I think that we can do better as a society. But all of that to say, for so many years, they've basically said that, oh, we're not going to advertise women of a certain size because they're not going to sell our clothes. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, we see a market here. We're going to advertise. I almost see it as they're trying to exploit these women just to make more money because they are kind of in a downward slope when it comes to their funding and the money, the revenue that they're bringing in from sales. So eh, I tend to agree with you. I think this is more of an exploited move than anything else. I think it was the great poet and songwriter Gretchen Wilson once said, (laughs) Victoria's Secret, their stuff's real nice, but I can buy the same things on the Walmart shelf, half price. (laughs) So so I I don't shop at Victoria's Secret either. It seems like they're trying to be part of the woke Olympics and getting in the the conversation. So I've seen it, done it. You know, it's Nike. In terms of like the size 14, I've talked about on the show, I lost a lot of weight in 2018. I was above a size 14, now below a size 14. You know what? There is a point to be made where women should see themselves in models and that Every model shouldn't be a size double zero. There are women out there who are size double zero naturally, and they look great. But at the same time, when you're pushing sizes, I'm not going to use a value, but at some point, being obese is unhealthy. And telling women that they should be too big is the same thing as telling women they should be too small. We should just kind of embrace women where they're at and not think so much about what their scale is and what that number on this scale is. So you know what? Some people, a size 14 is really obese for them. But some people, a size 14, is that's just how their body is. And so I think when we're just worrying so much and we're so nitpicky about what a size and what a woman looks like, Victoria's Secret puts women in their underwear on magazines and sends it out all over the country. I don't know if we should be looking at this as like, oh, they're empowering women, da, 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 size 14. How could they do this? It's like, where are we in society that this is like a controversy? <laughs> a huge <laughs> ordeal. Yeah. That's just true. But yeah, so a size 14, you know, but like on certain people... If size 14 is big and on certain people, size 14 is small. So, you know, you just got to love your body where it's at and try to be healthier and try to work out more and try to eat healthier. And then the part about being vegetarian and that's fat shaming people, whatever, it's her belief. And I guess some people think that cows and meat are bad for the environment. That's not fat shaming. That's just saying, hey, this is what I believe. It's crazy in other ways. But yeah, again, the woke Olympics hits another victim. Yeah. Well, and it's just, again, it's It's funny to me how now anytime an organization chooses to kind of do something a little bit bold or outside their norm, everyone has to have an opinion and everyone has to weigh in. And really, it's getting more and more to where you feel like organizations can't do anything right. I mean, whether or not Victoria's Secret have pure motives with this. You know, they're they're kind of trying to be more inclusive and say, hey, look, we have this woman who is larger than our traditional models. And and now they're just getting tons of flack for it. It's like, gosh, they can't do anything right. (laughs) But 
In efforts to be even more <laughs> inclusive, Victoria's Secret has also included their first transgender model in the campaign. Valentia Sampeo is a 22-year-old Brazilian model and a biological male. The model will work with Victoria's Secret for the duration of the campaign, but Victoria's Secret has made no commitment to keep Sampeo on. And Victoria's Secret's efforts to appear more woke, as we've mentioned, uh, do come, Rachel, as you said, in the midst of the brand's decline. Earlier this year, Victoria's Secret announced that it would close 50 stores due to declining sales. So what do you all think about this? I mean, will Victoria's Secret see an increase in their revenue by bringing on a transgender model? I don't think so. Because their stuff is so expensive, I can't imagine somebody seeing that and being like, oh my gosh, I have to go to the mall right, right now. now. And just going back to our previous point, it seems offensive to me that both a plus size model and a transgender model are both kind of the equal amount of wokeness. You know, like they're equating a woman who is slightly larger, but it's still her natural body to a man who now thinks he's a woman, which are just two separate things. And it just blows my mind that this is where we're at, is that a man is now a woman and that's somehow progress on a magazine that's sent out across the country where they just put women in their underwear on the cover. Yeah, it's really an insult yeah. to women in my mind. It's like, yes, these are equal. Like a slightly larger woman and a man that thinks he's a woman. Gosh. So should Victoria's Secret's hiring of a male model concern not just conservatives, but also feminists? I think it should. I mean, we've had people here at the Heritage Foundation. There was a lecture that I came to here recently where Julia Beck, she is a very liberal feminist, and she was saying that in pushes for gender equality, basically women who have worked to create employment and spaces for themselves in the public eye, they're basically being pushed out of their spaces because men who think they're women, as you mentioned, Virginia, are invading those spaces. And I think that's something that we need to take note of because as this happens more and more, I think not only conservatives, but also liberal feminists who see what's going on here, they're going to be saying, this is not fair. And I think it's insulting, as you guys mentioned, and also just not right that we're kind of just relinquishing spaces that were taken over by women that women have worked for to people who are not women by definition. And isn't that the only justification for the catalog and all the pictures is that for women to celebrate their bodies and now they're showing a, a man's body, it just kind of negates their entire argument. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, you think of that, that role, that job on that campaign would have been a job for a woman out there. But now a man has taken it. All right. Well, we are going to take a quick break. And I uh, want to mention another great podcast that we have here at the Heritage Foundation. It's so easy to get overwhelmed by the 24-7 news cycle, and I know that you might be overwhelmed as well. So if you're looking for a way to keep up with all of the news that matters, the Daily Signal podcast brings you the top news of the day. I co-host the Monday edition with my colleague Rob Bluey to bring you interviews with lawmakers, authors, and conservative activists. And of course, we start your week off right with a good news story. If you're a conservative who wants to be on top of the news, check out the Daily Signal podcast, available every weekday morning. Welcome back. And now we have a little bit more serious of a story. We want to tell you about Marie, an 18-year-old woman raped in her Washington State apartment in 2008. The officers assigned questioned her story because of some detailed inconsistencies. And after countless retellings and interrogation from police, she started questioning herself and her story. She told police it might have been a dream. She couldn't remember anymore. After dropping the case, the police charged her for filing a false report. In 2011, the man who raped her was convicted for 28 counts of rape. He picked victims in different policing districts, so law enforcement were unaware of his pattern. Investigators were only able to connect Marie's case to him because he took photographs of his victims. A photo of Marie with her learner's permit on her chest was found among his belongings. The new eight-episode series on Netflix, Unbelievable, dives into the story showing how two of the investigators found the rapist. The series pulls from the ProPublica and the Marshall Project's collaborative article, An Unbelievable Story of Rape, written in 2015. The Netflix series breaks down the story into two parallel pairs and compares and contrasts their outcomes. On one hand, we see Marie, the victim telling her story, and the officers in charge of the case who don't believe her. On the other hand, we see the victims whose stories are believed, and Detective Stacy Galbraith and Detective Edna Hendershot who believe them. These are two very different outcomes. The officers who didn't believe the victim falsely accuse a woman of lying, 
and the officers who did believe found a serial rapist. In the ProPublica article, one of the detectives who found the rapist, Stacey Galbraith, said, quote, A lot of times people say, believe your victim, believe your victim. But I don't think that's the right standpoint. I think it's listen to your victim and then corroborate or refute based on how things go. The officers in charge of Marie's case might have said something similar to this if asked how they should investigate a rape case. And yet these investigations went into completely different directions. So what are your thoughts on this? Rachel, I know you watched the entire I <laughs> season did. over the weekend. I was sick, yeah. and that's what I ended up doing. And I have to say, watching the series in kind of a marathon fashion, I wish I could have taken it a little bit slower just because it was so well done. But I think they hit the nail on the head here in saying that a lot of times these cases are approached in the wrong light. And I think what happened with Marie and the officers that were investigating her case, at least the way it was portrayed in the Netflix documentary, they seemed like they were just wanting to get her to, you know, testify, whether it was telling them in person or writing down her account of it personally. And they wanted to basically hear a statement, corroborate with a few different people and then move on. And they weren't necessarily or they didn't seem to be, at least in how it was portrayed in the Netflix documentary and wanting to actually find out what actually happened, taking the time. And that was contrasted to, Lauren, as you mentioned, the two female detectives who worked on some of the other cases that the man who raped her, he'd also raped these other women. So I think, I mean, it showed basically what happens when people aren't really wanting to get to the nuts and bolts of the case. And they just say like, oh, these are what we have right now. We're going to move on. And whereas the other two detectives they took the time they met with people and they kind of combed through things over and over again and at the very end of the series the police officer that marie had to basically tell her case to multiple times he had said like you know we were wrong we should have done this the right way and i mean yeah it was just i think a lapse in judgment and these two women basically showed them this is this is how you handle something like this it can't be done immediately yeah rachel i definitely agree with you i think the juxtaposition here is you have two detectives that took the time to fully consider the facts and then you have two detectives that got in marie's case and essentially very caught up with the emotions of them kind of thinking and feeling like oh this girl is lying and these things don't add up but they didn't take the time to actually look at the facts and comb through the evidence And a lot of this, it's interesting. So I haven't finished the Netflix series, but I did listen to another podcast that went all the way through the true story, Marie's story in detail and interviewed Marie. The police officers very heavily considered the testimony of Marie's former two foster moms. And both of those women came forward and said, "Ah, something isn't adding up. This doesn't actually really seem like the Marie that we know. And it feels like she's lying. And what ended up happening is the police officers took that as the hard and true facts and they kind of ignored what they should have been actually investigating in. I think it just it gets at this underline of okay in these situations you kind of can't trust that human emotion you have to go by the evidence and the facts that are before you. And I saw something that was really similar and I think I'd mentioned this to you Lauren. I don't know if this is and I want to study this more to see if this was the case but in the Amanda Knox Netflix documentary she spoke about how she even basically started doubting herself and everything that had happened in her case because people questioned her so much. And obviously part of figuring out a crime and who is guilty, who's innocent, what happened is questioning them. But again, when you take the testimony of secondhand people in the case who might know the person over the actual person who was wronged, that's where you get into very nasty territory. And I mean, I hate to bring more politics into it, but we see this in Me Too, where people were actually listening to the testimony of others talking about the character of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh rather than actually talking to him and the people that he supposedly wronged. So we see this in society more than I think we'd like to. Yeah, I love the quote from the detective that says, it's not about believe your victim, it's listen to your victim. And and when you're listening, you know, eventually you might believe, but you're going to gather evidence and you're going to give your victim, their time in court and their time to really make a case. And with Netflix, really recently, too, their program has gone really leftward. You know, LGBT is a whole category on Netflix now. So when I started watching this, I was kind of nervous that this was just going to turn into some like cop bashing, basically justify what Kavanaugh's hearing and, and believe all women. But it's not. It was honest. It showed that good people can sometimes make bad decisions. And it showed a lot of forgiveness. And Maria has forgiven. And it went more into this, into that This American Life episode that you mentioned, 
Virginia, she's forgiven every person in this story. And the, the cop who, you know, didn't believe her at first really came forward and was like, I'm sorry. And they talk about how the police department thinks about this case every day and it, it affects how they do their policing. And, you know, I think this is what should come out of the Me Too movement is that Unfortunately, sexual assault and and women being abused is part of our society and it's going to happen. And we can't just say like, oh, Christine Blasey Ford came out with this accusation that is unproven and now we don't believe women. We have to really take the time to listen to women and as women come forward with our stories when this is happening and support one another. But don't demonize men and don't jump to conclusions on either side. Our colleague Amy Swearer wrote a really powerful article that I'm going to link to in the show notes. But I just was reading that again today. And yeah, it's 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 just really unfortunate and really sad and really scary that, that this is a reality for women. But at the same time, we can't demonize men and we can't just jump to these conclusions and we can't fit this on a poster board. We need to really take time to find policy that actually helps women a lot of women who've been in situations like this or who are worried about something like this happening to them feel concerned that if they went to the police after being raped, they would be met with the same treatment as Marie. What do you guys think about that? I think that that's a valid concern. And I know just speaking as a woman who, I mean, I have you know sisters and friends and other women in my life, I think the general tendency, not of all women, because I have some very very confident women in my life too. But sometimes we tend to second guess ourselves and to doubt ourselves and say, oh, well, is this worth being reported? Is Was this was this a rape? And something that was brought up during the Netflix documentary was the, one of the detectives was interviewing a college student and she had said, well, you know, did you rape this person? Or they were talking about rape. And he, the student said, well, I didn't actually rape her. She just had sex and didn't want to. And the detective was like, but that's the definition of rape. And so I think it's important that we encourage women in our life and ourselves to to speak up if something like this is going to happen. And as you mentioned earlier, Lauren, and to speak up quickly, I mean, the more time that we allow to pass that we don't say something that could be harming ourselves or others. And, you know, as a second point, by not speaking up, if something like this would happen to us, we're not only doing a disservice to ourselves, but other people who might fall into the line of this person who is abusing women or raping them, they could be harmed as well because we haven't spoken up. So I think we have not only a duty to ourselves, but to others to be honest, you know, if something like this would ever happen. I think for any woman who goes through this sort of horrible experience and trauma, there's always going to be some little voice in your head that's coming up with an excuse of why you shouldn't report it, whether, you know, you're scared about photographs being released or, you know, backlash from friends or family or, or even the police. But like Rachel said, it it's something that you have to do both to get justice for yourself, but then also to protect other women and other individuals out there that might be in harm's way because of this individual. Yeah, so I think it's it's definitely important to speak up and to report it. And with the release of this Netflix series, Unbelievable, I hope that one of the results of this is that it will cause police districts across the country to consider the way that they process rape cases and how they think about these cases and how they process them. Okay, so the show is called Unbelievable. It's on Netflix. It's eight episodes. Would definitely recommend to give it a watch. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, we're going to crown our Problematic Woman of the Week. Overwhelmed by the 24-7 news cycle? Looking for a way to keep up with the news that matters? The Daily Signal podcast brings you the top news of the day, plus interviews with lawmakers, authors, Heritage Foundation experts, and more on the most important policy debates in America today. If you're a conservative who wants to be on top of the news, check out the Daily Signal podcast, available every weekday morning. All right, welcome back. We are excited to crown our Problematic Woman of the Week, and hint, she is in the room with us. Rachel, we are crowning you Problematic Woman of the Week because of a very problematic podcast interview you did last week. I, you, yeah. Can you, yeah. <laughs> I caused some trouble, and I wasn't really honestly even expecting it. Sometimes when I'm writing an article, and especially an op-ed, sometimes I'll be like, oh, yeah, I might get some like flack for this, but I was not really expecting any flack for this just because it was a podcast interview and I wasn't even the one being interviewed, but here we are. So recently, last week, I did a podcast interview with Haley Halverson. She's the Vice President of Advocacy and Outreach at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation here in Washington, D.C., and we're talking about the true effects of pornography. And we have a clip for you to play from that podcast episode. 
real patent effects. Since 2011, there have been 40 peer-reviewed studies that showed pornography has negative and detrimental impacts on the brain. Even like it shrinks regions of the brain associated with motivation and decision making. It's highly linked with sexual violence. There is a meta-analysis of 46 different studies and it found that clearly and consistently pornography is linked to increased risk for committing sexual offenses and accepting rape myths. It's linked also to even problems with sexual function. Back in like the 1940s, Men who struggled with erectile dysfunction below the age of 40 was around 1%. And since the boom of the internet, the boom of internet pornography, it's around 25% of men under the age of 40 struggling with it. And that's typically because, you know, people's sexualities are getting wired to screens instead of people. And suddenly pornography is becoming more arousing than a real life partner. So Haley and I spoke after she had uh, delivered some remarks at the Heritage Foundation at a summit on protecting children from sexualization. And so shortly after this interview was published, I received an email which read in the subject line, what's a man to do, dot, 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 with a question mark. And so given the subject line, I was somewhat surprised to pretty quickly find out that his message would be in defense of his pornography use. So I'm going to read what he had to say to me. Hi, Rachel. As a divorced man in my early 50s, there are needs some men do have I don't know most ladies understand. When I was married for 17 plus years, I always told her I'd rather make love to you and my door is never locked. Some men need and must have regular releases. Regular performance art movies with consenting adults doing legal things art-wise provide an amazing service that has helped me keep my sanity since looking at I Dream of Jeannie on TV as a five-year-old kid. Are we men supposed to look at a blank wall? Your thoughts, please. Thanks and God bless. Live free or die. God bless America. So I'm not including this man's name because I want to protect his identity. I thought it was interesting how he even signed this letter saying thanks and God bless, and he's just defending this practice that is really degrading to both women and men. But I'm just I'm curious to hear what you guys think of this. And uh, in opening it and reading it, I was just like, wow, like, I'm glad he reached out to me and wanted to talk about questions he had. But I just think it's so sad looking at this from just the standpoint of his marriage and seeing that, you know, he was married for 17 plus years, and now he's divorced. And the fact that, you know, I'm sitting here reading this and Haley and I had even talked about on the podcast together how over, I think it's over half of marriages that end in divorce cite pornography use is one of the reasons why the marriage has ended. And in reading his note, I just broke my heart and I was like, wow, like maybe if you took some more time to work on your marriage and to talk about these issues rather than, you know, saying my door is, you know, my door is always open to you, but I'm going to engage in this practice because this is fulfilling my needs over you your marriage is now no longer a marriage. And I think, you know, a lot of women say, and even women who find, you know, that they have pornography addictions, that basically it takes away the desire for the, you know, human on human contact. And that's replaced by what they see on a screen. And it's just so sad. So I found his email to be heartbreaking. I'm so glad that he reached out. And I just think that it's a conversation we should be having because in today's society, this is a huge problem that we see with both men and women. And I think if we want to have successful, you know, dating relationships and marriages, this is something we should be talking about because it is a skirt on our society. And I've talked to friends and even when Haley and I did our podcast interview, she was saying that a lot of times pornography addiction is harder to talk about than substance abuse like drug or alcohol addiction because it does carry a lot of shame in it. But I think by talking about it, having these conversations, it opens us up to, you know, more honest, more trusting relationships where this isn't an issue, even if it's been a struggle in the past. Yeah, it's something that we definitely need to be talking about. And I'm glad that we're talking about it today because it is it's this quiet killer of relationships. And the lie is that I can do whatever I want in the private of, you know, my home, bedroom. It won't affect my current marriage. It won't affect my future marriage. And that really is a lie because as as you mentioned, what Haley said, you know, both physically, there's an issue, <laughs> uh, but then also just mentally and emotionally, you know, it's stirring up things that are meant specifically for a spouse that God put in us. And it's allowing a computer screen to receive our emotional energy and attachment 
in this way that is supposed to be so beautiful and so intimate with a spouse. Mm hmm. And I like, too, he brings up gender here that some men need. <laughs> what about women? <laughs> yeah. Men and women both have sexual desires. And, again, the way that he wrote it just seemed like, oh, only men need pornography. Well, nobody needs pornography, but it only affects men. But it's sad. And he talks about it. has been thoughts in his head since I Dream a Genie on TV as a five-year-old kid that he needs these kinds of releases. That People always think, oh, I'm the exception. It won't affect me. But – and I, I don't want to – group this man into who we were talking about with the child pornography issue that we have in America. But I think addictions start with, you know, just a little bit. And the more that you, you're you taking in these images and the more darker and deeper your sexual desire gets, and especially too, because most of these people, it's underground, it just leads to not good things. And so it's, it's just really sad. And to see and hear the way that Haley really put the way that it's affecting our generation and it's affecting young men and it's affecting young women. It's just really sad to see that this man just kind of nonchalantly says, no, nah, you know what? It doesn't affect me. I need my release. It yeah. just seems selfish. And it, it is like you mentioned, Lauren, I mean, it is an addiction and that's why it's so important to be aware of. And according to Marian Layden, she's the co-director of sexual trauma and psychotherapy program at University of Pennsylvania Center for Cognitive Therapy. She was saying that it's harder for people with a pornography addiction to basically recover than if a person is addicted to cocaine because those who are addicted to cocaine can get the drug out of their system by not consuming the drug. But pornographic images stay in the brain forever. And I think that's why it's so important to be aware of like this is not just something that can be necessarily easily addressed. I mean, you have to work on it. There has to be some dedication there. And it's not like other substance abuse drugs with drugs or alcohol where you can just stop consuming it. And while you still might have the desire it's easier to say no because it's out of your system where, you know, psychologically it's in your brain and it takes a lot more willpower and dedication to overcome. And it's teaching young women that sexual abuse and like rough sex is okay and that's the norm. And in the podcast clip, it Haley talked about how it increases sexual abuse. But I also think it's just like it normalizes it for women and that women are supposed to be this kind of person in the bedroom to really fulfill every man's sexual desires. And that's not what sex is about. It's about two people expressing love to one another. And yeah, it just, it rewires your brain. And and I think also something that many people might not realize, but that, you know, we've been talking about a little bit recently is just the people that are in those images and videos. It's not always consensual. There could be victims of sex trafficking, it could be children. You might not realize they're a child, but you need to consider the fact that you could be watching something or looking at images that are people being forced to do these things. And is that something that you want to be investing in and partaking of? That's such an important point. I'm so glad you brought that up. I was looking through the comments actually on this podcast on uh, the Daily Signal website, and people said that very thing. There are some people that are saying, oh, well, this is completely consensual and it's nothing we should worry about. And whether it is consensual or not, and I know some cases, like you mentioned, Virginia, it's not. I think as a society, society, we also need to be thinking, is someone's exploitation, is that worth basically, you know, sacrificing and exploiting this person for my own sexual gratification? And I think if, you know, not necessarily, you know, maybe some of us, I'm a person of faith, but for people who aren't, just looking at that question and being like, if you know, is exploiting a person is that worth basically making myself feel good? And I think any of us, if we thought about that question, I, I mean, it's something to ponder, like putting someone down and basically saying like your pain and having you perform this act, you know, while it's going to make me feel great, that's not something you should be subjected to do. I think it's something that we should all, you know, be thinking about and asking ourselves. Well, if you want to listen to the whole interview, it was part of the October 10th episode of The Daily Signal. It is titled The True Effects of Watching Porn. We'll also link to it in the show notes. But thank you, Rachel, so much for illuminating that issue and discussing it, even when some people disagree. So for that, we are making you Problematic Woman of the Week. Thank you, Lauren and Virginia. And shout out to, to all the people. I just want to shout out to friends and others that I've talked to this issue about and their honesty and how they're making the world a better place by talking about this issue. It's so heroic. I know those people by name. They're some dear close friends of mine. So I just want to shout out to them as well. That's awesome. And with that, that's going to be it for this week's Problematic Women. Join us next Thursday morning for a brand new edition of Problematic Women. And in the meantime, please subscribe and share. 
Conservatives need your support in the podcast world, and we would greatly appreciate a five-star review on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. Those, thank you to those who have done it. It really does make such a difference. Have a great week. This podcast is a product of The Daily Signal, produced by Kelsey Bowler and Lauren Evans. Special thanks to our editor-in-chief, Katrina Trinko. We produce Problematic Women in remembrance of our dear friend and former co-host, Bree Payton.